Hello, and welcome to the latest of our Tank Evolution series. This time, we're going to be looking at the development of tank ammunition. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members, and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can, and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. To make sense of this, you have to understand that it's part of a complex process, a vicious circle of technological development, if you like. On the battlefield, a tank has a number of different tasks to fulfill, but a big part of it is obviously fighting other tanks. Uh, now to do that, you need good tank guns and ammunition. But of course, to counteract that, armor improves. So guns and ammunition improve again, armour improves, and you can see it is a continuous circle of development. Now, the first armour-piercing shells predate the tank by a bit over half a century. By the 1860s, warships were starting to include armour protection, so naval guns needed to fire shells that could penetrate that. The first tank gun to see service was the Hotchkiss QF six-pounder used on British heavy tanks Mark I to Mark V in the First World War. This is in fact a naval gun design, but it's chosen for its availability and for the fact that it's compact enough to fit in a tank sponson. The shell fired was a six-pounder semi-armour piercing round, uh, what's known in the terminology of the time as common shell. And what that is, is a forged steel projectile with an explosive charge inside and a base fuse. Six pounder is a British military and naval term, and it relates to the weight of the round fired by the gun. In fact, it dates back to the days of cannon and cannonballs and stuff like that. Um, the other way to describe it would be the diameter of the bore of the barrel. So six pounder equates to 57 millimeters, 17 pounder to 76.2 millimeters, and so forth. Simple. Although the shell was designed for naval use, it was also effective against land fortifications such as pillboxes. The copper band you can see here at the base of the shell, that's called the driving band. And what happens is, as it goes down the barrel, the rifling, the grooves in the bore, cut into that and they give it the spin that uh, lends it some stability. This one, as you can see, there are no grooves. It hasn't actually been fired. Then we've got the brass case here. That contains the propellant, and in this case it would have been stuff called cordite. Um, and that, if you could see inside it, it looks like small bundles of spaghetti. And then round the base of the shell is a percussion cap. That is hit by the firing pin, and that sets off the propellant. Now it doesn't actually explode, it burns very rapidly, it's combustion. And the gases produced force the shell down the barrel. The case and the driving band between them provide what's called obturation. And what that is, is they have the effect of sealing in the gases, keeping the pressure in the barrel as high as possible. And that produces maximum velocity. Apologies if that's a bit basic for quite a lot of you, but if you haven't had the opportunity to handle tank ammunition, you may not know what all the bits are and what they do. Tank versus tank fighting was just about unknown in World War I, one instance. But as we move into the interwar period and tanks become more like the fast-moving weapons of assault and exploitation we know today, the realisation comes that tanks will have to fight other tanks. Therefore, over the last century, a lot of the effort that's been put into the development of tank ammunition has been about developing better armour-piercing rounds. Now, armour-piercing rounds rely on kinetic energy, masses of it, more the better. So the round hits the tank and just punches its way through. Now, originally, they were solid shot, like this British two-pounder AP round from 1939. The projectile is made of chromium steel, it's forged, not cast, and then it's annealed, and that gives it maximum hardness and tensile strength. The muzzle velocity 
is 792 meters a second. And this round will penetrate up to 40 millimeters of armor at up to 1,000 meters. And that is more than enough to deal with most of the early war German tanks, Panzers 1, 2, 3, and 4. As tank armor improved though, a simple lump of metal wasn't up to the job. We have two problems here. One is how to achieve maximum kinetic energy for penetration. And the other is how to stop the round disintegrating on impact. Well, the solution that was devised was this. APCBC, armor piercing capped ballistic cap. And this is the M61 75 millimeter round as used by the M4 Sherman. APCBC, um, it's not as complicated as it sounds, is an armor piercing round covered with a blunt cap of a softer metal, which is in turn covered with a sharp ballistic cap on top. Now, kinetic energy is half the round's mass multiplied by the square of its velocity. So a good way to increase kinetic energy is to make the round fly as fast as possible. The sharp ballistic cap keeps the round aerodynamic, so it maintains its velocity as it flies towards the target. When the round hits the target, the soft ballistic cap absorbs some of the energy, so it minimizes the damage to the round itself. It also aids in penetration of sloped armor. Moving on from this, the next development was APDS, Armor Piercing Discarding Sabo, used by the British Army in the 6-pounder and 17-pounder tank and anti-tank guns from 1944. This used tungsten. Uh, that's a metal that is harder and more shock resistant than steel. However, it's also about two and a half times denser. So if we made our APC BC round out of solid tungsten, it would be so heavy that the propellant couldn't get it moving fast enough. APDS, armor piercing discarding Sabo, solved this problem uh, with what's called a sub caliber round. Now the projectile is this little bit here. This is the Sabo. And that's a jacket that guides it down the barrel and then falls away uh, as it leaves. And that leaves a small, very dense, very high velocity projectile to go onto the target and achieve maximum penetration. How much more? Well, the 17 pounder APCBC weighed 17 pounds or 7.7 kilograms. It had a muzzle velocity of about 900 meters a second, and that meant it could penetrate something like 150 millimeters of armor at 1,000 meters. The APDS round is just under half the weight, so this is roughly three and a half kilos. Its muzzle velocity is 1,200 meters a second, and it will penetrate up to 233 millimeters of armor at 1,000 meters. This is a 105 millimeter uh, APDS round as used in the British Centurion, as we have here the West German Leopard 1 during the early part of the Cold War. The round itself, and this is just the projectile bit, has been sectioned so you can see what's going on inside. And there would, of course, be a big brass propellant case uh, on this as well. To make things even more efficient, APDS evolves into this, APFSDS, armor piercing, fin stabilized, discarding Sabo. This is a 120 millimeter round as fired by the chieftain I'm standing next to. The idea with this is the projectile becomes longer and thinner, so it's higher velocity, and the impact on the target is concentrated into a much smaller area. The problem is that a long, thin round like this becomes very unstable in flight. So to correct that, the designers added fins on the end, rather like the feathers on a dart, and that corrects the stability problem. Because of this, the British nickname for an AP FSDS round, the fin round. The projectile, the dart-shaped bit, is known as a long rod penetrator. The Sabo is also changed from the pot shape of APDS to this one, three petals held on by nylon bands. When you fire one of these from a tank gun, it's traveling at between 1400 and 1800 meters a second. That is extremely fast. It is twice the velocity 
of our two pound around from 1939. And when you add in a hard, dense projectile traveling at that sort of speed, there are occasions, and particularly talking of the older uh, ex-Soviet T-tanks here, when this long rod penetrator can punch its way in one side of a tank and go straight through and out the other. At close range, the effect of an APFS DS round can be absolutely devastating. US Army Abrams tank officer Captain Jason Conroy reported that in one engagement in Iraq, Ray White's tank spotted a T-72 in an alley to the left as it pushed north. His gunner, Sergeant Cully Alexander, fired a Sabo round and that tank virtually disintegrated. Its engine was knocked out of the main body and its turret was popped and sent spinning into the air. The next day, the turret was found over 300 metres away on top of a three-storey building. As we can see, traditional steel armour doesn't provide particularly good protection against APFSDS, so more modern tanks and AFVs use either composite armour or ERA. If you want to know more about this, please watch our Evolution of Armour video. Most fin rounds are still made of tungsten, but another material, depleted uranium, or DU, is also used. This has caused a certain amount of controversy because of the perception that these rounds are radioactive. In fact, some Russian commentators have accused the British Army of supplying Ukraine with nuclear weapons. But this really is not the case. Depleted uranium is waste from nuclear power stations, but the whole thing about it is that it is depleted, so most of the radioactivity has been drained off. That which is left is relatively minor. It's also, it's, well, it's not much denser or harder uh, than tungsten, so why use it? Well, there are two main reasons. The first is that DU is what we call pyrophoric. So fragments of the round on impact will break off and they actually combust with the air and you stand a chance of burning out the target vehicle. The second is it's what's called self-sharpening. Without getting into a load of technicalities, um, when a rod penetrator hits armour, the end of it will bunt, it will mushroom. Uh, but the advantage of DU is that it exhibits something called adiabatic shear. And what that means is that the edges of the mushroom will break off. And that keeps the point sharp and aids penetration. So far, what we've been talking about are pure kinetic energy weapons. So what you're doing is you're chucking a hard, dense slugger material at the target at the highest possible velocity. But the next two rounds I want to talk about, Heat and Hesh, operate on different principles. Heat, high explosive anti-tank, is a shaped charge round. An explosive charge with a base fuse packed around an inverted hollow cone, usually with another hollow standoff element in the nose of the round. These are most associated with handheld anti-tank weapons, like the British Piat, German Panzerfaust, and the Soviet RPG-7. But they've also been produced as a tank round. When the round impacts on the target and the charge detonates, the explosive force is focused by the collapsing cone to form a superplastic jet that's projected forward at very high velocity. In fact, it can penetrate up to seven times the round's diameter. The first tank gun to fire a heat round uh, was the KWK 37L24, um, and that's a gun that's mounted on the Stug 3 Panzer IV early on in the war, and in this case, the Panzer III. Ausfuhrung N. Now it's a short barreled, relatively low velocity gun, but the round, uh, the GR 38 HIA, did at least give it some anti tank capability. The heat round uh, operates differently to the standard armor piercing round, although it's still a kinetic energy weapon. It's just that the kinetic energy comes from the explosion of the shaped charge rather than the impact of the round itself. Um, and what this means is that its velocity uh, really doesn't matter. Uh, it can be very low indeed. In fact, it can be non-existent in the case of things like anti-tank mines and anti-tank grenades. Hesh, high explosive squash head, as we have here, 
doesn't actually penetrate the armor. But what it is, is a fairly thin skin round with an absolute dustbin load of high explosive inside and a base fuse. When this impacts on the armor, the nose compresses, the round squashes, and then the base fuse detonates. When this happens, a shockwave passes through the armor of the target, then rebounds backwards off the air armor interface on the inside of the vehicle. It then meets a secondary wave coming forward, and the combination of the two blasts a scab of metal off the inside of the armor into the interior of the target. This jagged lump of metal, traveling at up to 300 meters a second, causes catastrophic damage to the vehicle interior, and especially the crew if it is in the fighting compartment. The British Army has used Hesh since World War II um, against armour, against soft skin vehicles, and as a general purpose high explosive round. But the problem with Hesh is that for accuracy, it needs to be fired from a gun with a rifled barrel. A rifled barrel isn't so good for firing APFSDS though. Uh, the rifling creates friction and the spin absorbs energy. What that means is a lower muzzle velocity and therefore less penetration. For this reason, when Challenger 3 replaces Challenger 2, the gun will be smoothbore, and that will bring the British Army into line with NATO and actually most of the other armies in the world. This is a hugely complex subject, and I'm afraid we really haven't got time to deal with it in a video of this length. Most of what we've looked at so far concerns anti-tank capability, which is a big part of what a tank does, but by no means the whole story. The thing to remember is that tanks have a number of different tasks to fulfil on the battlefield, from fighting other tanks, to supporting infantry, to defending themselves against enemy infantry armed with anti-tank weapons. Tank guns, therefore, need to be able to fire a range of different rounds suitable for different targets. If we take one famous example, the 8.8cm KWK-36 gun, uh, as carried by the Tiger I, the gunner is able to draw on four different rounds. Different rounds are fired at different velo velocities. So um, something like a, a Hesh round doesn't need the same extreme velocity as APFSDS as a fin round. Now in the British Army and in Chieftain Challenger, uh, we're inside Chieftain now, that's achieved by using different sized bag charges, propellant charges. So for APFSDS, you would use a full bag of propellant, the maximum charge. The gun is laid straight and level, and the round comes out of the barrel and traveling about 1,500 meters a second. Now for Hesh, you've used a half bag. So the muzzle velocity is only about 800 meters a second, but the difference is the gun is laid on the Hesh setting, so it's slightly elevated. And that gives the lob effect to give the round its range so that it drops down onto the target. Different armies use different techniques here, but the principle remains the same. I'm aware this has been quite a superficial look at a complex subject. There's quite a bit we missed out. We haven't mentioned case shot, for example. Uh, it's a bit like a giant shotgun cartridge full of ball bearings and used against infantry or uh, for clearing fire lanes in dense foliage. We haven't mentioned smoke shells or rocket assisted uh, or guided munitions, uh, let alone how you get rid of the spent brass to stop it cluttering up the turret. Despite that, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please subscribe if you can support us on Patreon, and we hope to see as many of you as possible at Tankfest.